Thank you. Well, I'd just like to, to thank everybody, if I can put that down somewhere, to thank Riyad and George for that introduction, and also Emma for helping us organise it. And it's a great pleasure to be here at this first ever symposium. And we do have a, a lineup of fabulous speakers, so I feel a bit like the first penguin in the water, because uh, uh, there are such well-known famous authors that are going to be talking that I think I've got a bit of a task this morning but I'm going to run through some of the areas of evolutionary psychiatry with you just to give you the sort of background of what we think we're covering. Uh, obviously I can't give all the data and all the exact details because there are whole textbooks written on the subject um, but what I will do is say that our, our psychiatric bulletin article got published this Saturday so we have put some copies around the room, but if you look in the bulletin, is the first, the first editorial, it's there this weekend. And just to give you a little bit of a warning, if you Google evolutionary psychiatry, you may get some slightly crackpot websites. And the word evolution is added to a number of different endeavours which are not necessarily scientific. And some of them are sort of paleolithic diets and quack treatments. And that's not what we're about. Um, there is no copywriting on the words evolutionary psychiatry, so we can't stop other people using the words. But be a little bit careful about what you think is our endeavour. And just a, 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 another thing for those people that are slightly sceptical, I suppose everybody here is interested rather than sceptical, but we're not there to treat people with evolution. And we're not there to start something like a eugenics movement. And I'll explain more about that later. But these things do get confused. And is some of the reasons that we think probably evolution hasn't been accepted into the mainstream in any large way for a long time. Um, anyway, I'll start, I'll start the actual talk now. And I will run through a little bit about what we think evolution can contribute. Well, I think it can contribute in a whole range of areas. And there are some really good books covering this. My first book in the subject was by Randolph Nessie himself, Why We Get Sick. Now, there's only one chapter, I believe, are mental disorders, diseases. But this book made such a big difference to me actually in the way I thought and I was just uh, explaining to Professor Nessie that I've given this book to more of my trainees and friends than any other book so it's a marvellous book although 21, 22 years old now but it's still very relevant and of course there are the other books that are interesting there's uh, John Price and Anthony Stevens book Evolutionary Psychiatry little quirky, little Jungian in place for some people's taste, but some marvellous chapters. And one of the most recent, uh, the second edition, of, by Martin Bruner, if you want to read all about the connection between evolution and all the different psychiatric aspects of training and medicine. Now, what do I think evolution can offer? Well, I think we've grown up with the various, various models of psychiatry some of which have been more helpful than others. There's the broken brain, the deep biomedical model. And although I'm not American, which is probably very obvious, there is a, a tendency to think of psychiatric disorders as diseases. And of course, some are. I think all of us agree Alzheimer's disease is a disease. However, it spawned a movement which has been helpful in some domains and less helpful in other domains called anti-psychiatry or, as, is, as it is called now, critical psychiatry because many of the psychiatrists that have some of these beliefs do actually treat patients and they're not anti-psychiatry, they're critical of the biomedical model. And this led to a sort of polarised opposite of the biomedical model, if, if that's a fair characterisation, which 
suggested that as there weren't blood tests or pathology changes in mental illness, it's only a metaphor. And that although the human problems were real, the illnesses weren't, and that we were really sort of quacks and frauds ourselves for saying that we were treating disease. Evolutionary psychology came along and moved the debate forward. This was interesting, but it really didn't cover the range of disorders and conditions that psychiatrists had to deal with and seemed a little bit academic. And then those of us that have read on the philosophy of uh, disorders came across somebody called Jerome Wakefield, not to be confused with Andrew Wakefield who did the MMR vaccination uh, research and scandal. They are different people. And this was helpful. It's got its own issues. It doesn't cover everything, but it looks, that, looks into psychiatric disorders that may have biological mechanisms. Well, um, I think it goes further than that. It says that all behaviour has biological mechanisms and that there are also psychosocial or subjective domains which are not necessarily biological, which have to be achieved for something to be regarded as a disorder. And this was a, a move forward. So, for instance, you can have a, a disordered function of an organ, but it is not necessarily a disease or a problem. So, for instance, infertility is a problem, but if you have um, a vasectomy, you wouldn't regard that as a disease because it's something you're wanting to have. And so the fact there is biological alteration in itself does not mean that it's a problem for somebody. And equally, because somebody has a problem doesn't mean to say you see a primary biological abnormality. And there's a lot of uh, discussion about this as whether you need both criteria or one or the other, and what does that mean for treatment? Now, we, we've moved on from that, and it is more sophisticated than that double strand, although I think Wakefield's model with these two strands is a significant improvement on just one or the other. So where does evolution fit? Well, we're just, I've just been talking about there's no single agreed unifying framework. We use biological criteria, we use psychological and social criteria, and we're often at odds with our colleagues. But each of these models only provides bits and pieces of an explanation. There's no consensus as to how we put it all together, or why we have to put it all together. Why are we biased psychosocial beings? Are things like murder or terrorist bombing, rape or paedophilia illnesses? How, how do we decide? Why are there no biological tests for schizophrenia? Why can't we do a, a gene scan or something, a DNA test, and say, oh yes, you've got schizophrenia? So I thought I'd just give some general definitions of the words I'm using so it becomes a bit more clear. I'm using the term condition that includes all diseases and disorders that cause problems for people. But a disease, I'm taking the Zatzian idea that there is a pathology, cellular biochemical, affecting the body, and that a disorder can be an abnormality of function without necessarily there being pathology of the organ and that illness and sickness are the subjective terms of you know, when the person feels bad or disadvantaged in some way. So we're really challenging the conceptual framework using evolution, and we see it as a, a meta-theory of why human beings are around and have the genes and the features that they do. We are challenging purely reductionist, sort of atomistic, neurochemical, genetic models, 
saying that there are other things that are very important in psychiatry, and we're equally challenging people that say there's nothing to do with genes or biology. And we're also asking questions like, why do the genes still exist that cause schizophrenia or such things? You know, what, what are the reasons they're still around? What processes are occurring? And uh, I, I see Professor Dunbar's arrived. <laughs> And I saw an interesting article, which I can't go into now, that is suggestive that the reason that some of these disorders are, are at around the 1% are because of the social brain and Dunbar's number. But I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about that number in a, in a few minutes. So we're, we're challenging dualist as well as non-biological outlooks. So we have here a sort of philosophically spaghetti junction. We've got the humanities, history, philosophy and religion, and we've got the sciences, the proximate, the immediate sciences like DNA and neurochemicals. And we are looking at the, the psychosocial models. Why, what, you know, where is the social in all this? And we're trying to bring them together in a formal model to say why are these psychosocial things so important to us? Why is religion important? Why is music important? Why is the social so important? So in Darwinian or evolutionary psychiatry we think that these sorts of mental processes were naturally selected now, there is dual inheritance. There is the idea that there is both genetic inheritance and, in humans, and some other species, cultural inheritance. So it's not all genes. And that our heritage has resulted in mental mechanisms and that mental conditions, whatever they might be, different in dif on different occasions, can interfere with these processes. So, for us, the concept of disorder in psychiatry must refer to the dysfunctions that harm the person. And there's a rider here. It's in the current environment or social circumstances because things may have changed from whether it be 200, 2,000, 20,000 or 2 million years ago, depending on how these things were set up. And that's what's worth exploring. When were they set up? How were they set up? Why? The why questions. Now we do look at a species perspective. We do look at individuals, but we don't, as I mentioned at the beginning, treat people with evolution. And I think Professor Ness, Nessie has actually said you'd have to be very careful if somebody says they're treating you with evolutionary psychiatry. You'd have to check that they've actually using treatments that have been clinically tested, not, not some quack diet or something. And I mentioned here the uh, environment of evolutionary adaptation. This is probably best described as the ice age and, and the time when human evolution in its most recent form is most evident but I'll, I'll leave the evolutionary psychologist to discuss that in, in detail because there's a much longer history and there's a more recent history as well of changes for instance lactase persistence and such things as the uses of drugs and alcohol which have altered the whole chemistry of uh, the environment which were very different from what was available a thousand, ten thousand, or a hundred thousand years ago. And in evolutionary psychiatry, we don't really look at the evolution of a disease, because most diseases are not adaptations, but we look for vulnerability. Although, there are some things which appear to have nothing to do with evolution at all, and, for instance, if you get hit by a brick, that hasn't got an evolutionary explanation, if a tree falls on you. However, and I think there's a very interesting um, YouTube video with Professor 
Nessie and Richard Dawkins when he explains about collis fractures. And although the actual trauma itself doesn't have an evolutionary explanation, when you land on your wrist and you break the bones, why are the bones so fragile? Why can't we have more robust bones? But uh, if, you, uh, if you Google Richard Dawkins and Randolph Nessie and evolutionary medicine, you can find out the answer to that. But it's something to do with uh, the ability to supinate and pronate. So what do we cover that standard models are not covering? Well, we're hoping to cover the why these things became important. And from why are these various uh, conditions so prevalent in the human race? How much of it is our genes? How much is it the society we're in, a mismatch? And should we, should we be getting rid of some of the um, reactions that are occurring to social events? It, it, you know, when do we treat with medicine? When do we treat with uh, psychology? And evolutionary psychiatry has theories related to this on a whole range of different disorders. And I want to emphasize that we're integrating, not replacing current scientific knowledge. We're not saying the science is wrong, we're saying how does it all fit together? So it's a meta-theory. So here is the Tinbergen diagram. Now this is my favorite diagram because this brings in the ideas that development is important, that this acts on our genes, which are very important, and our genes have been selected by natural selection, and that that results in development and that there are approximate mechanisms. These are not either or, these are both and. So we have things like neurotransmitters, hormones, but also thoughts, affects, and other things going on here and now, affected by the immediate environment, which produces behavior. And that these behaviors in a group, because one individual doesn't evolve, but behaviours which more, are more adaptive according to the environment allow more genes to get into the next generation. So things, we're talking about survival and reproduction. Not necessarily what is pleasant or unpleasant for an individual. Because some things can be pleasant and not adaptive and some things are unpleasant like pain and adaptive. And we're looking at not only the mechanism, but individual development. And as we look at it, function and phylogeny. And these are what we call ultimate explanations rather than proximate. And so we're suggesting new ways of viewing psychiatric phenomena, complementing the conventional approaches, putting them together, not displacing them. And there's a quote here from, again, I'm sorry, I'm using a lot of Professor Nessie's work, but that's because it's so well argued from the point of psychiatry, that we're not machines. There are lots of quirks in the genome and what comes out. And we're not going to get into false dichotomies. You know, there are a lot of people arguing about, you know, is Ritalin good for children or bad for children? Should we be ch treating children with ADHD with drugs or should it be psychotherapy or is it parenting? And I think we need reasoned debate about what ADHD is and why children have it, not, not just that it's automatically a disease. Is, is it adaptive? Is it like pain or is it like depression or anxiety? What are we doing? Why have we got this brain circuitry? But what we're saying is that the neurotransmitters are there, but they're not the root cause. They're subservient to the other things that are going on in the outside world or with the, that are with the genes already. And uh, for instance, let's give a trivial example. We all know that oxytocin is involved in relationships. 
But oxytocin isn't the relationship. It's important, as indeed adrenaline is important in anxiety. But if you're frightened by a lion or a tiger, you don't just say, oh, the cause of anxiety is the adrenaline. Or equally, if you have a cough, is the, you can suppress cough with uh, opiates, but you don't say the cause of cough is a lack of opiate in the cough centre. So we can say these things, but where are, we, where are we going to intervene and why? What is safe? And I think this is hugely important, because we're not arguing that the hormones and the drugs are irrelevant and it's all got to be psychotherapy. And we're not arguing either the other way, that it's all social and psychotherapy, and that the chemicals have no role, or the genes have no role. It's both. And how they interact is the critical bit for us. How and why. Now, this is from Gluckman, and th there are a range of hows and whys. There's mismatch. I mentioned something about alcohol. We can prov produce far more alcohol and far stronger than other mammals. So other mammals eat fruit with alcohol in it and they metabolise the alcohol. They don't necessarily get drunk, although I gather sometimes there are fermented fruits where elephants and other, other mammals get very drunk. But they don't do it habitually. But we, we can actually distill alcohol. And there's a mismatch. Our ability to produce that amount since the Neolithic Revolution means people can become alcoholic. Very important, another reason we have problems is because of life history factors. Our genes, which to a degree determine at what age we can reproduce, although that is also related to what is going on socially, and... Uh, Things like aging, menopause, and senescence. The change in APO2, 3, and 4. APO4 is slightly protective. And I can't go into this, it's another talk, but there's something about grandmothering and also about the length of childhoods and kin selection and inclusive fitness involved with how the genes are changing over the generations. And maybe we're in the middle of an evolution of APO E4. Now, excessive defence mechanisms, I'll go on to that. That's about when things like depression get triggered or anxiety gets triggered too much or at the wrong time. This is not really the concern for today because most psychiatric illnesses aren't due to pathogens. But I think it's well recognised that a lot of evolution has... Um, it's much more evident in antibiotic resistant and pathogens and it is in psychiatry so I don't think we have to make the case for that although I do think uh, probably some um, bacteriologists and people using antibiotics willy-nilly would do well to have a think about this and then there's constraints why do we have a recurrent lar laryngeal nerve why do we have bad backs you can't go back there are, there are points of no return in evolution which lead us to have vulnerabilities. And that may indeed be the case behaviourally. Sexual selection, mating strategies. People do very strange things. They have urges and behaviours which get them into all sorts of trouble. But natural selection is there. Evolution produces not just survival, but it's about reproduction, not happiness or necessary uh, health of an individual. And this may explain why males have a much higher mortality rate than females in the, in the, uh, the well, throughout the age range. Then there are other issues like balancing selection, things like antagonistic pleiotropy. Never heard of it when I was at medical school have now, and this is about when genes are good for you perhaps when you're young but not so good for you when you're older. Different environments, different situations. You never hear of it in Alzheimer's research. Why not? Demographic history, bottlenecks, things like Huntington's, and also 
um, as it say at the bottom there, which is related to sexual selection, selection favouring reproductive success at the expense of health. People reproducing early when they're not mature enough, or people only having a few children when they're older. What are the risks and the trade-offs? And I'm sure Professor Ness is going to go into this in much more detail in his talk. This is about the pathways, the defence mechanisms that can go off badly. And I think psychiatry keeps confusing defence mechanisms with the actual disease. That's like confusing the pain with the broken leg. If you have a broken leg, just treating it with pain relief may be dangerous. You wouldn't treat appendicitis with just pain relief as a surgeon. However, if you've got a broken leg and somebody does the appropriate medical treatment for it, doctors do give pain relief. So we're not saying you shouldn't have pain relief, but it's what you think you're doing and when. What are you adjusting and when? Are you actually dealing with all the issues that need to be dealt with, or are you missing some and just giving medicine and hoping things will sort themselves out? Is that risky? One small issue some people think that we're saying that all mental illnesses are adaptations, have been selected by evolution. That's not what we're saying at all. And there are a number of people that write sort of critical articles sort of saying that that's what we're trying to do. I think we're called pan-adaptationists or pan-adaptionists or some other term. Or sometimes we're called uh, um, universal Darwinists in some sort of you know, saying that everything has a Darwinian explanation or is, uh, uh, has reproductive or natural selection value of some sort, which is not what we're trying to do at all. And uh, I just thought before I get any older, Riyadh put this into my presentation. I can't tell you all these theories, but here are some useful evolutionary links. And what I would recommend is that we're hoping, we're very lucky to have Eddie Stevens here, who's a BBC cameraman, he's going to record us today. I recommend that people take some of these things down and go away and explore these issues, because I can't possibly explain all the things I need to in 30 minutes. Um, but just sort of covering the general area today of what's interesting. And here are some links. And we've also got our evolutionary psychiatry website on the Royal College. We're going to put all the presentations, if we can extract them from all the speakers, um, on the website, as well as the actual videos. And hopefully in time we'll, we'll put other links to special papers and you know, other websites, uh, although we do have a fair number already. So just quickly... To go through Darwin's primary theory, is it? Oh, I've got 12 minutes left. Why Darwin is important? Because he said that there are different traits. Traits vary among individuals. And that these different traits, which include behavioural traits, not just bones or physical organs, we think that these different traits convey different rates of survival and reproduction. And, now we know how, but in his day, he said these traits can be passed from generation to generation, and we now know that can be true. There is a genetic component to many mental illnesses. Why? What's going on? Now, being a sceptic, I thought I ought to put some things about why evolution is irrelevant, or why it could be. So taking that basic theory, if there's no such thing as mutations, or they cannot be passed down, well, that's, uh, that's obviously a, 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 almost a circular argument that it's wrong, because we know there are mutations. But of course, not all illnesses are mutations. We're not trying to say that. Or if they're passed down, no mutation in the genome could produce any sort of phenotypic change that drives natural selection. 
or that there's something that always gets rid of mutations, or that any environmental or other pressures don't favour reproductive success of better, better adapted individuals, evolution wouldn't be occurring in humans. And evolutionary psychiatry in particular would be irrelevant if biology has nothing to do with behaviour. Now some people say that, don't they? There are those people who are completely anti-biological in psychiatry. Um, but we can't argue with people that have an ideological position because they don't believe it, but I think we have to argue where the biology is important, or that there is no genetic component to the mental disorder at all. We have a, a problem arguing what's going on. Or the other way round, which is outside environmental or cultural influences don't affect any biological processes. I mean, that would be the whole of psychiatry up the Swanee, wouldn't it? The, so, I mean, that, that can't be true. But also, th there are a range of psychiatrists. I, I, I've spoken to some philosophers and critical psychiatrists and got very short shrift. They really don't want to know. And they think it's not relevant because it doesn't help our understanding of the disorder. And I hope today will gradually change or add to people's understanding. Also, philosophers think we're just biological reductionists. We're only talking about the genes and the chemicals. That's not true. Or leads to neglect of psych psychosocial factors. They're massively important. The genes were selected in an environment of psychosocial things happening. That's the whole point. Or that human subjectivity, meaning, or the uniqueness of the individual is somehow compromised if we talk about it in this way. That's not what we're doing either. I want to make that very, very clear. And in fact, subjectivity is massively important, as is meaning, because the same event, let's say a picture of, I said this to George, a picture of his mother or his daughter may look exactly the same in my eyes as his eyes, but what it means to him will have a completely different biological effect on him. There is also, I think, apathy. But part of that's lack of exposure to evolutionary ideas. There is this tremendous apathy where people say, oh, yes, we know humans evolved, but that's nothing to do with medicine or psychiatry. And that's the end of the discussion. You know? So you can't really argue with them that they don't believe in evolution, but equally they're not looking at how it illuminates what we're doing. Or there's the uh, appeal to Hitler, as uh, ad Hitlerium, I think they call it in philosophy, where people say that it's uh, eugenics or somehow we're trying to you know, produce some sort of genetic changes in our patients or something. I, I don't know, but it's not what we're trying to do. And of course, lastly, there is the religious ideological opposition, which I gather is quite a lot worse in America than it is in this country. And a comment on values, in case anybody th is thinking along the eugenics questioning, I think it's really important that patients are complex. They should be treated as unique individuals and given all the human rights. There's no argument about that. And whether something is or is scientifically correct is not the same as whether we should be doing something as a doctor. In fact, we are anti-evolution. Doctors try and stop natural selection and survival of the biologically fittest. We try and treat people who are ill or weak or vulnerable. So we are not there colluding somehow with some pitiless, indifferent, natural selective process. And those sorts of ethical issues are not resolved by science. That's about ethics. So I like this sentence here. And we're not another ideology. We hopefully are not only a science, but will be judged by the standards of science. And we recognize that people do need things like music and religion. 
and this is not a competition. And that some things, such as placebo, are very, very important. And the interpersonal, which gives rise to a large amount of the placebo responses we see, and again, I gave a talk for George at the Royal Society of Medicine on placebo, hugely complex psychological phenomena there because of the social brain and evolution. Very, very important. And that these things, placebo, social and reproductive processes, enlist common brain systems, common brain chemicals. And this raises many, many questions. How do these things all affect the brain? And why? Why have we got the genes and the circuitry that does that? Where does that come from? Why was it selected? And when it goes wrong, what do we do about it? So, ultimately, we think that all human behavioural strategies have a biological component and are, therefore, biological phenomena but can only be understood, like the Wakefield suggestion, within their correct social environmental context. And therefore, it is legitimate to speak of the biology of human social behaviour and, indeed, the biology of culture. But it's not the only thing that's important. Now, therapy is important because I mentioned we don't go around peddling quack therapies that are not tested. And I, I think we're hoping to get Paul Gilbert next year to talk about his compassion therapy. And I think many of our therapies could be usefully guided clinically by evolutionary sensitivity and ideas. When to treat, when to look for other things, rather than what do we do after the third antidepressant has failed, try a fourth one? What else should we be looking for and why? And it also reinforces, ironically, having been accused of being reductionist and biological, that the psychological and social are massively important components. And that as psychiatrists, I, 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 I feel very worried we're moving into quick fit by payment by results. You know, we do a quick history with a, um, some, you know, I don't know, Hamilton rating scale or something, PHQ-9, give an antidepressant and discharge the patient. That's, you know, it's just like changing the tyres when they're worn. And I think psychiatry is becoming very minimal. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a great worry and great concern to me that we become quick fit fitters. And I showed three books at the beginning and there's another one here. And you'll see uh, uh, an article in our newsletter, our last newsletter that came out just before this, um, SIG, um, from Alfonso Troisi about the possible contributions to psychiatry. But going back to my beginning thesis about anti-psychiatry and biology and the conflict between them, it is possible to eliminate the necessity to find a brain lesion or even a dysfunctional mechanism to validate the distinction between disorders and non-disorders. So this work has not entirely been done. It's not complete. We're at the beginning. This is the first SIG on the subject. But we've got the opportunity to investigate, to think about, to use these fabulous ideas that people have come up with in evolution, to use them within psychiatry instead of just a blanket, quick-fit medical model. So... To summarise, we're asking new questions. Why are we vulnerable? And I've mentioned some of the categories of answer, although at breakneck speed, and I'm sorry if it's rather quick, but you can look at it online. To actually look at a functional understanding, why are things there? What is normal depression? provide a framework where we can have a deeper, more empathic understanding of individuals and behaviours. 
and to look at things that only evolutionary biologists have looked at before. I mean, how come psychiatrists don't look at kin selection? And I, I noticed my colleague, uh, Annie Swanipol, here from Child Psychiatry. She's recently got an article in Advances looking at all those things. And, you know, we're at the beginning of being able to put the two together. And it provides a way to think about the development and the way that early experiences act on the child. And Professor Ness is going to bring up emotions and regulation this afternoon. And I think you've got a new book out about it, but I'll do the plug later probably. <laughs> and we need to have a better diagnostic system, don't we? Symptom lists with no understanding of why. They're, they're fine, but they... They seem to be rather dry and cause a sort of atomism of thousands of thousands of subcategories without anybody thinking about why, what's going on. You know, is bereavement an illness? Should it be in the DSM-5 or not? And we hope that we can also help with multiple causal factors, why some people become ill and why some don't. But it is different to the rest of medicine because trying to look at evolutionary ideas and not just looking at the current chemicals and genes. We, have to, we can't go back, we aren't Doctor Who, we can't go back in the TARDIS and look at why the genes were selected or what genes were even around. We can go back to sort of far as Neanderthals, but we can do it with comparative species to an extent, but then there is, of course, speculation and guesswork. But that's what we thrive on trying to look at what can be shown. We don't know everything yet. And I hope we do advance the endeavour and that we explain psychopathology using the range of other disciplines and what they give us and that we stop just having this medical model of there's a sort of perfect human genome and a perfect human behaviour and anybody with anything that differs from that is ill. That really doesn't work. That sort of, well, George will put me straight, Greek essentialism, as if there's a, a pure form of something, is Victorian thinking, or it may be ancient Greek thinking. But we've moved from that. There are a range of genomes, there are a range of possibilities. And to finish off, there was a, a famous teacher of biology who I believe was involved in the neo-Darwinian synthesis with uh, R.A. Fisher. And he said, nothing in biology makes sense in, except in the light of evolution. And I think that's important. It's the light of evolution we want to shine, not just to say everything is evolution. And that we have all this emphasis on neuroscience and genes. But if you read the Yellow Journal, our, our, our journal of the Royal College, you get these lists and lists of genes. Nobody's saying, why are they those genes? Nobody's asking, how is this involved with hallucinations or socialization? We just get lists of correlations. And I don't know whether it was Darwin. I probably got the quote wrong. But it's like listing rocks in a quarry, but having no theory about what you would think you're going to see. These are just loads and loads of rocks. And I think we need to have a better idea of why those genes were selected and, and try and find out. So I think it's time not just to rethink evolution in biology, but to implement it in psychiatry. And that's the end of my introduction. And hopefully it's made some sense running through it at that speed. But an important thing, we have a newsletter that we're going to try and get out a couple of times a year. We do want articles for people looking at ways evolution is important, and even sceptical letters. You know, if, if, if people think there are reasons this is difficult. I mean, there are difficult things, like whether we look at genes at the level of the individual, the group, or one minute left, or at the 
level of just the selfish gene, the Richard Dawkins idea. These things are very complicated, and if you, if you jump between the different levels, you can make considerable errors. And so if people want to write articles about psychiatry and about evolution, we'd be very grateful for them, and Riyad and I will look at them sympathetically, even if they're not you know, following what may be conceived as a uh, Darwinian dogma. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. So, Paul, thank you very much for such a fair, thorough, and clear introduction. Any questions or any points you want to make to Paul? Stunned everybody into silence. <laughs> Well, I mean, we've talked a lot about uh, things, Paul, over the years, and one of the things that you taught me and got me interested in evolution is this idea that society, so social and psychological factors are inherent part of evolution and uh, vice versa. I suppose the question is, how do you come to evaluate the significance of the different factors in any particular case or any particular scientific uh, problem? And I wonder whether you have any thoughts uh, about that. That is a struggle. It's a struggle for us with or without evolution. And I, I haven't got a simple answer to it. I, uh, and I, I don't want to sort of... Um, flannel around it but I think you have to take it the best I can say is take it in a perspective of um, when you take a what should be a detailed history rather than just doing a depression rating scale when you take a detailed history you get developmental and you get current social circumstantial issues going on and I suppose we never get enough to do that in a, um, a hugely controlled way, but we do look at you know if somebody's having an affair or a bereavement, or whether they've been abused as a child, or whether there's a family history of schizophrenia or bipolar, and we take that into account. I, for instance, I'm always much more worried about giving an antidepressant to somebody with depression if I know their mother, father, and grandparents have all had bipolar illness. And I don't think you can put a figure on it. And maybe that's work that needs to be done. Uh, and I'm not quite sure, as you, uh, as you point out, how to do it in an easy, easy way. But I think that's what we do professionally. And I know you do very thorough court reports where you're looking into those issues. And I think we're at the beginning of trying to do that. It's something that was probably done 10, 20, 30 years ago, but we're in danger of sort of losing for some reason uh, as we get payment by results and you know the internet uh, idea of assessing people over the phone or over the internet. We're losing the, those nuances. But how to do it, I think time will tell, and that's work in progress. Thank you. Yes, at the back. Could you say who you are, please? Yeah. I'm Andrew Blewett. I'm a I just wonder whether you uh, think that uh, part of the reason why um, the penetration of evolutionary thinking into medical practice and, and psychiatric practice in particular might have been hampered or delayed in some way it might be to do with how the fact that as doctors we're largely concerned about pathology or disorder <coughs> less concerned about normal uh, phenomena. Um, our uh, psychology colleagues or anthropological colleagues or a whole range of other scientific disciplines aren't uh, professionally obligated to think about uh, when things go wrong uh, as we are. and don't spend 90% of their time in the scope of looking at that, but at least that's how I imagine things might be. I just wonder whether in some ways, because a lot of disease is rooted in proximate Back 
methodology by all the various uh, companies that you've got to buy? I think you've answered your own question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with the greatest of respect, I, I think that that's the problem. But I do think that you know when somebody comes to you with a problem, and I think it is useful to look at things like the smoke detector idea about anxiety. You know whether somebody's triggering their anxiety too easily, uh, and I, I find that you can sort of it's not normalise but humanise people with excessive anxiety and explain to them about um, th this very useful concept of the smoke detector principle whereby somebody may um, have too many false positive alarms. Now, of course, a smoke detector is massively important. If you turn the smoke detector off, you can die. So people with no anxiety do badly. And if the smoke detector goes off every night, all through the night, you don't sleep. You do rather badly. So the trick is, when, when these things are going off too much, too often, or in the wrong way, to know, uh, and you, you sort of mentioned this, what is the normal to get something back to that so that they remain safe, have the appropriate responses and not inappropriate responses. Now, this is partly why diazepam is so dangerous. You can wipe out somebody's anxiety very effectively, and they'll walk straight in front of a truck. OK, there are other cognitive and other issues with diazepam. It's not just pure anxiolytic. But, you know, when somebody's depressed, we don't give them large amounts of cocaine and make them high, do we? And I think, I think what we can do is look at what these... Uh, emotions are for, and, and, and that's, these defences are different to looking at, you know, why do we have schizophrenia? Why is schizophrenia prevalent at 1%? And I think they're different questions, but I think they're worth asking. You know, what, why is there a worldwide, just about the same in every country, incidence of these illnesses? Or why is anorexia very different in different countries? And I think... I think they stand some evolutionary consideration. But I'm not trying to say evolution is the only dimension, the only domain to consider. It's the missing domain that I think illuminates the others, but it isn't the only domain on its own. Is there a final question? I mean, just a brief uh, comment. Um, in a sense, what we're saying is that all psychiatry is all psychiatry is evolutionary psychiatry because um, there are no humans that have not evolved. Um, so um, we want to get to a situation where um, uh, uh, the, the evolutionary dimension is implicit in the thinking and decision making. Uh, that goes into yes. uh, clinical practice. So it, it, it is in the background there. Um, but there's I a way to go. Yes, uh, and, and uh, 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 I mean, there is, there is a long way to go to get to that particular point. Um, uh, but, uh, I mean, that is our destination. Is Our hope uh, is that this is where uh, we would like to see psychiatry. And in fact, hopefully, the best outcome would we, we would become superfluous because it would be part of the mainstream. But I think we've got a way to go on that, and I think um, there's a little bit about medical education yet before we can say that's been achieved. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you.